Welcome to the Rural Recharge, a podcast of the Florida Farm Bureau Federation. Rural Recharge is a guided conversation that allows you to cut through the noise and multitude of information out there. You should be able to trust your sources, which is why we're a platform that comes straight from the source, the farmers and ranchers growing what we eat, wear, and use every day. Our guests today are Lynetta Griner and Eric Hanley of Usher Land and Timber, a family-owned and operated timber and cow-calf operation located in Levy County, Florida. That is west of Gainesville and before you get into the Gulf of Mexico. We're pleased to have Mrs. Griner and Mr. Hanley here today. Florida Forestry Week is in October and we're excited to highlight the timber industry coming right from the source here at Usher Timber and Cattle Company, Land and Timber Company in Levy County, Florida. Welcome. Thank y'all for joining us today. Thank you for having us. It's a great pleasure to be invited to join in your Rural Recharge podcast. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Good to have you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having us. We're going to start off with a few questions. Mrs. Griner, can you tell us a little bit about the operation, the background of your family's farm? Sure. My my family on my mother's side um, started settling here in the mid-1800s. They came from South Georgia, cattle and wagons and things like that, and they happened to settle at a place called the Clyatt Fish Hole. And oddly enough, once my parents started putting together our farm, one of the properties they bought contains the Clyatt Fish Hole. So our farm contains a property that really has significance to our family's history. My dad's family um, on the Usher side came here in the early 1900s in the timber business. He was in the turpentine business. And that evolved to our, our timber operations today. So um, our ranch, our farm, was actually put together by my parents, Edder and Helen Usher. And they just started buying a section of land, uh, 20 acres, 40 acres, whatever they could afford, anytime they had any disposable income. That meant that, that my sister and my brother and I didn't always have the, the latest toys and, and things like that. And um, today, I really appreciate the sacrifices they made to build what we have today and, and the legacy that they left us in Usher Farm. It's a beautiful piece of property, and um, we're so happy to share that and share our story with people. Personally, my husband and I had different career paths, and I had one brother, Tommy. He was killed in 1989 in a boating accident, and as a result of that, Ken, my husband, and I Um, decided it was really important to change our career paths and take over my family's business. And um, so here we are today. We're loggers and cattle producers and timberland owners and um, think we're in exactly where we need to be. We've never looked back and questioned that decision. So we're um, happy to be here to advocate for agriculture with you today. Well, it's such a blessing to to know that tragedy out of tragedy came a blessing and bringing you back to a a family heirloom and a lifestyle, a livelihood, a a long-time heritage, genealogical heritage. That's really a blessing. What Explain to us just a little bit, because our... our the audience may not have a familiarity with Levy County and what's what it looks like. Tell me just a little bit about the land. What is it? Tell it. Is it is it flat wood soils? What is take us through and describe what it looks like? So Levy County is bordered on the northwest by the Suwannee River. As a matter of fact, Ken and I live permanently on the Suwannee River at Fannin Springs. The Suwannee flows into the Gulf of Mexico at the town of Suwannee. And it's because of the health of that river that we have such rich estuaries. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we produce such great shellfish and fishing opportunities. But um, so we have the river. We have springs uh, in our county. We have a lot of agriculture. We have a lot of crops, uh, row crops like watermelon. We have a big watermelon festival in Chieflin because of um, that particular commodity. Peanuts are a big commodity in, in Levy County as well. Williston on the east side of our county has the Williston Peanut Festival. <clears throat> and then in Cedar Key, we have the aquaculture and seafood, and they have a big seafood festival in um, the fall. So we ha- offer a lot of different agricultural operations in Levy County. Of course, timber, I think, is, is important as well, Absolutely. because that's my family's interest. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Mr. Hanley, 
you're a part of the almost like the family at Usher Land and Timber. Tell us, how did you end up at Usher? I went to Auburn University, um, which isn't very popular around this part of the state, but it's um, orange and blue. That's not a problem. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Just different shades. <laughs> anyways, I went there um, kind of on a whim. Just to, my family. I have family history at the university, but what I st- study in forestry was just kind of a look neat. Decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, didn't really have a career path planned out, but um, went to forestry school. Decided that uh, I wanted to be, do a little bit more, so I stayed and got a finance degree as well. Uh, and then um, because of my connection through family members with Ken Lynetta and them knowing quite a few people in the agriculture industry, by the time I graduated, I knew I wanted to be involved in agriculture in some way, whether it be agriculture banking or um, doing what I'm doing today. But um, So I contacted them more or less just to help kind of guide me in a direction to where do I need to send resumes, who do I need to talk to, and just honestly kind of got lucky that they were looking for somebody and – I was looking for a job, and um, at the time, I actually, my wife and I had moved to the Virgin Islands, and we was doing accounting work there, so we were ready to come home, and um, just kind of fell in our lap, and ended up here, and then, you know, I've been in agriculture most of my life. My fam, my immediate family was in the building business, but my, my parents' side of the family was um, cattle. That's about, we didn't do timber down south. We didn't do any road crops, so I spent a lot of time on the land, um, on water, uh, so it just kind of worked perfectly for us. You know, um, money is important when you when you own a business, but uh, enjoying what you do is, is more important, and that has been a really big um, thing for me is just that I wake up every morning and don't dread going to work. Um, the industry, it makes it that way, but the people we have that, that work at Usherland and Timber Kennel and at Corey, um, you know, our longtime staff, it's just a – it's an enjoyable place to work, and it's a, you know, timber is such a huge, huge impact on everybody's life. So it's Absolutely. it's not just, you know, the job. It's, you know, if you don't have people like us, what is this, you know, what is the world? What is the community? What is the state? Um, what do we what do we lose when we lose a working forest? And to me, the big picture is is very important. But, you know, it's just, to me, it's really neat, and Mrs. Griner especially, talking about it, the uniqueness of relationships and personalities, but how that Eric's skill set fits so well within your operation and the family atmosphere. I mean, in the timber industry, you're growing a long-term crop. I mean, it takes a long time to turn that turn that money back around, and yet y'all have long-term relationships. And you, you mentioned some of the staff that's been here a long time. How's Mrs. Griner, how, what, what's the longest tenured person that you have that's worked for you? The longest tenured is no longer with us, but he worked for my family for 56 years. That's impressive. And his father had worked for my father as well. So, um, and then other members of his family had worked with us for off and on. Even in our shop today, um, Stevie John Fisher and his brother uh, Spencer are, are our main shop guys, and their uncle used to work for us. He was our welder. So, we have a lot of family connections within our, our organization, and um, that's so important. It's like Eric said, you know, we, it's a job, but it's, it's um, something we all enjoy. And I think as long as you're, you're enjoying it, having fun, you know, living out your passion, then it's not a job as, as some people see it. It's, um, it's just about doing what you enjoy, and that, I think that's important. That's, we laugh a lot, we kid a lot, and... Um, they give me a hard time. You don't. Do, you wouldn't do that, Eric. I, I can't imagine. No, Every you'd be chance. totally respectful. Every chance I get. <laughs> but you know, to me, here it is. We're we're going to be talking about stewardship of land and stewardship of, of and especially when it comes to uh, Florida Forest Weeks is October twenty second to twenty eighth. But I want folks to understand because as we get to know you on this podcast in a very short period of time, it's not only your care of land; it's your care of people, and this is a relationship that goes deep, and it and it's. And I think it's very important for everybody to know that our industry, it's not, it, to find the uniqueness of skill set is very rare. Somebody that decided to go to the school of forestry, that's even a rare thing today to find somebody that has an interest in being in the woods and actually being involved in the timber industry. Kind of a, a very narrow, small group of, of, of folks to draw from. Wendy and I have actually, our son, one of he's a, he's a forester, but that's a, a very unique thing. But I, I just, I find it so interesting as we talk to people on this pro- podcast that, 
you know, to find out them about them personally, the longevity, the long, the length of time, the love for, the love for land, but a love for people. And you definitely possess that. And it, I just think it's very, very special, but it is, it's Florida Forest week, October 22nd to 28th. Give us a little insight on what that week means and what message Florida foresters are hoping to communicate to our public audience. Well, it's interesting that, um, we're in an industry that very few people, very e- even few Floridians understand is so important to the state of Florida. Um, agriculture is the number two revenue generator in Florida after tourism. And when tourism's down, it's ag that carries yes, the state. Ma'am. And within ag, timber is number one, number two uh, commodity revenue generator, depending on who you're talking to and what day it is. But um, over half of our state, 17 million acres, is, is right. covered in forest. And it's amazing how people don't understand that and, and realize not only are we producing fiber, but we're also producing ecosystem services, those intangible benefits from our lands, whether it's water recharge, water storage, um, wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, all those, all those intangible benefits we're also providing to the state of Florida and to the people who um, live here. That's what makes Florida unique and what brings a thousand people a day to Florida. But um, it's important for us to highlight the industry and to um, educate people. I think that's that's the goal of that week is, is education. And one of the things that Eric and I have been doing is going into the, our local schools and we have a little box, a demonstration box that we um, – employ to help the kids and the teachers a lot of times learn that it's not the landowner or the logger who decides how much wood we cut. It's the consumer. Hmm. And people don't understand all the different everyday consumer items that come or or incorporate products from our forest. And um, when you put it to them, when you hold up something that and ask them if they want to have that or not, They always want to have it, and that means we've got to cut timber in order to do that. But the beauty of that is that not only do we cut timber, we plant Plant timber. timber. Absolutely. And and today we have more planted acres of timber than we've ever had, and that's an encouraging message. Um, One of the things that, that has helped spur our interest is that back in 2006, my father was still living, and our local fourth grade class here in Chiefland, was tasked to write persuasive letters. And they chose to write letters to my father. And I have them here. I can, and, and they were trying to persuade him to stop his timber operations, to stop oh, wow. cutting trees. <clears throat> wow. And these are some of the things they said. Um, you're killing innocent little animals. You should find another job and stop this madness. Would you rather have life or lumber? One of my favorites is about the red-eyed tree frog. <laughs> Maybe I can find that one. Right. But um, he, he talked about, oh, here he says, um, do you like red-eyed tree frogs? I do because they are alive and happy. My friends don't like blood coming out of their eyes when they're on the ground because you've smushed them under a tree that you have cut. Wow. And another one suggested that we don't use trees, we just use stumps. Think about that just a minute. <laughs> How do you get a stump if you don't have a tree? But that kind of opened our eyes to the fact that people right here in our own own agricultural community community do not understand what we do and why we do it and the value that we bring to society as a whole by what we do. So we have a a lot of education to do, and we always uh, jump at the opportunity for to highlight forest in October. All right. Well, so, I mean, and, and folks can't see this, but she has a about a one-inch binder with these letters in it from years ago. I guess, you know, number one, we see that there is a, there is a, especially a very strong opinion based on misrepresentation of the industry. How do you respond, Mrs. Griner, that has this kind of perception? How do you personally handle it? Well, what we did, we... We created a, a box, just a mm-hmm. storage box, and we took the lid and poked holes in the lid. And But first we painted a little stream and then the, the forest floor, and wow. we used pencils in those holes, and that was our forest. And we explained to them that, we, that when we held up a product that they wanted, 
Do you want toilet paper? Do you want a cell phone? All of those incorporate products that come from trees. If they did, we would cut a tree. We leave the trees beside the stream because that's part of our best management practices. But, you know, every time we do this demonstration, those fourth graders clear cut that property except (laughs) for those streamside zones. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, they, and so at the end of it, do do they understand? Do, do you see, is there, does a light come on? Oh, yeah. And it's amazing how many of them come up afterwards and say, we're so glad you do what you do. Because they, they finally get that, you know, the things that, that they enjoy that make life so comfortable for us. Ha- almost, well, over 5,000 everyday products incorporate products from trees. And people don't realize that. I think the other night we were we were at a meeting and a logger got up and he says, you know, people don't realize it, but you put a pine tree in your mouth every day and it's you through do. toothpaste. <laughs> he said, just on that just on that one premise, a lot of people don't. And so, especially a fourth grader, that's very young for somebody to be so impressionable and have uh, a misconception of something that's so needed, valued, and and beneficial to them. And I, and it's. I guess I really wish I could see that box and and see how the, also how you portray it, because I, I it, apparently it is very impactful, and I'm just thankful for that. I'm gonna ask you, Eric, just a little bit different question. It's gonna sound probably a little redundant to the one that I asked Mrs. Griner, but how do Florida forests benefit the people who live here, from your perspective, and what contributions can they offer? Um. Well, as Lynetta said, you know, uh, Florida has a lot of mills. Uh, that make a lot of different products, many that most people probably have no idea come from trees or that they're produced right here in our backyard. You know, everybody thinks of lumber and paper. Those are the obvious ones. But, um, you know, we have a mill right here, two mills that make uh, horse bedding shavings, sure, sure. Uh, pellets for pellet grills or for, um, you know, running uh, power plants in other parts of the world. Uh, so there's all kinds of different variety of things that that the trees grow, that the trees are used for to produce for people to use every day. But, uh, you know, as Lynetta said, you know, there's a thousand plus people a day moving to the state. And, um, you know, trees just, I don't know about you, but when I drive down the road, I'd much rather drive through a forest than I would through a downtown concrete slab. But, um, so, I mean, it's just, you know, people move here because we have a lot of natural, you know, um, you know, the, like the springs, the rivers, and typically all those waterways are surrounded by forest. Um, you know, the air quality, the water quality, water is a huge topic in Florida. Uh, if you get rid of the trees, you're going to lose a lot of your quality, water quality. Uh, you know, Hurricane Michael up in West Florida, you right. know, they have a, a lot of beautiful beaches. And to me, you know, it's fed by, through the west estuaries and things of that nature, and there's a lot of timberland that was wiped out that may or may not be put back in timber and if it's not i can promise you in 10 15 20 years you're going to see a change in water quality change in the fisheries change in the uh, shellfish shrimp you know all the things that that come from that part of the state which just it just has a ripple effect that people have no idea um and you know florida you know being from florida living in alabama and you know different places you know everybody always made fun of me oh you're just a beach bum you just go to disney world they have no idea that, you know, look, agriculture is our biggest commodity. How it's missed in Florida so badly, I guess Disney World just kind of overshadows all of it. But also something I think a lot of folks don't know or understand is that you're growing a crop. Absolutely. And so you are tending to a crop. You are, this is a, it's a large crop and it's a long-term, long-duration crop to bring it to to harvest. Take us through some of those things that you do on this on Usher land and timber that that are healthy to the environment that that you see. And when you know when I drive by, I see you know a lot of times I, I because I'm familiar with timber industry, we have a little bit, but I see rows of trees and undergrowth and all kinds of things. But you do a lot there that some people don't know. Explain some of those things, whether it be burning or whatever. Absolutely. So one thing I'll point out before I get into that is is one of the really unique things about it as a crop compared to other crops is that, you know, when you look at the water and the air and those different things, there's a very, very little um, chemical application that goes into growing timber, whereas a lot of other commodities, you got a lot of pesticides, herbicides, different things. Um, Trees, you don't have to use any. I mean, we recommend using some. So... 
to begin with, just kind of go through the life cycle of a tree. So first thing you have to do is site prep. In Florida, uh, compared to a lot of other places in the country, we have a very long growing season. We have a lot of other um, uh, uh, weeds, trees, palmettos that are all competing for the same nutrient, sunlight, water that the trees we're planting are there. So site prep, getting the, the ground ready for the crop is critical. And that is when you do your first and one, maybe your only herbicide application. So that's done with mechanical site prep, burning, chopping, raking, um, and then herb, herbicide. Um, because Florida tends to get wet at times of the year, and, and a lot of the timberland is planted on wet ground, usually a bed is required to be pulled, which keeps the tree up out of the water. Um, the trees in today's world uh, is – more commonly hand planted than it has been in the past. So used to we used to use a lot of machine planting. Hand planting is becoming more um, dominant, and that's because the nurseries are making trees that are more genetically sure. um, advanced, and those trees are typically planted what we call containerized seedlings. So they're like planting a tomato plant you buy from Home Depot. You pull it out of a little plastic container and put it in the ground. Um, those things, because of those advancements, we don't have to plant as many trees per acre as we used to. That way we can still grow the same amount of volume with a little bit less input cost. Uh, and then as those trees grow, uh, you may require a mowing to keep the, um, you know, the other comp competition below the canopy of the trees as it grows up. And then once the canopy closure comes, the maintenance is kind of um, – stopped a little bit because it shades out all the understory so the sunlight doesn't get to the floor, forest floor and so you don't have as much competition uh, there's other things that come from a lot of very common uh, practices raking pine straw sure. uh, that is a huge impact on the landowner it's a huge impact on your all your people developing in florida for um, mulch uh, that all comes out of our local forest right here um, on around us so uh, and then you know, typically we'll do maybe a thinning operation when the trees are 15 to 17 years old. A lot of those trees will go to your pulpwood mills or your shavings mills, uh, make your paper products. And then we do that because you reduce the um, the stems per acre, and it allows the trees that are there still to put on a diameter growth, which that's when you get into your 1x4s and 2x4s and 4x4s. That's when they go to the sawmill. So then – uh, once you open it up, that's when your herbaceous comes back to life. And so you have a lot of fresh regrowth on the floor, which is great for your wildlife habitat, deer, turkey. Um, and then that's when the burning starts because typically uh, that is when wildfire risk gets higher because you have more fuel. Uh, so that's when, you know, the last 10, 12 years of the tree's life is when the, the more com um, intense management happens to protect them. And then usually around here, the normal is 28 to 30 years old. We clear cut it, and those trees, more more of those trees go into your, you know, boards and things of that nature, and then the process starts over again. So, um, you know, the, the rotation age varies depending on where you are and what your markets are. It could be a, as short as a 20, 22 years old and as much as 30 or so. Um, so it just varies depending on what markets are most advantageous to where your property is located. That's awesome. I think we just went through Forestry 101 with Eric Hanley today. I tell you <laughs> what, and just took a course in, in a di you know production side, and that's what you handle. But also, it's not all just production. It's you know there's other management and conservation things that Mrs. Griner that you alluded to earlier. You you, you alluded to leaving some buffer zones, etc. Take us through. Eric's definitely engaged on the production side. He, I mean, we're in tree farming, but also there is a strong conservation effort that you put forward on your place. Take us through some of what, what that looks like. So forestry in general practices best management practices. That's right. And it's all for water quality. And I'm proud to say that I think every year we have about a 99, 98% compliance uh, with, with those BMPs, and that's impressive. But, um, and that's, I think that's all the about strongest in the nation. I think so. And it, it's all about protecting that water. And we know how important that is to Florida. But on, on our particular farm, ranch, um, we have different age classes of timber. Mostly what we plant is slash pine, improved slash pine. Um, and we do that because we're growing it for commercial purposes. Um, a lot of people, a lot of um, state land is planted with 
long leaf. Sure. And that's that's because you have a different management plan for your property. Okay. Ours is a commercial timber operation, so we plant slash and um, and we, we follow the practice that Eric has just described. Um, there are a lot of tools that we can employ as landowners, um, and one is conservation easements. And we have, have participated in, in a program there. We did ours with the Suwannee River Water Management District. So conservation easements allow landowners to sell uh, the development rights of their, off of their property to either the state or a, a quasi-government or a, a non-governmental entity, somebody to hold those, those rights separate from the ownership of the land. That means that land can never be developed. There, we have a lot of uh, programs in the state of Florida, the Florida um, Forever Program yes. and also the Rural and Family Lands Program offers um, purchasing of less than fee conservation easements. And the rural and family lands particularly is targeting working productive agricultural lands, which is important to me because that means you can still carry on your agricultural operations, but the land can never be developed. Sure. That doesn't mean it can never be sold and, it, and you can't use it, but it just will never have development on it. And that's, that's important to the whole okay. state because... Sure. That's where we get those, those ecosystem services, those intangible benefits from those lands. Um, and, and I mentioned those ecosystem services, and um, I participate in a, an organization, that's a loose term for it, uh, it's called the Climate Smart Ag Working Group. It's a group of uh, producers who've come together and, and uh, partnered with the University of Florida, IFAS, to talk about how we can provide natural solutions to climate change. And we think that agriculture has a lot to offer. We, we understand we have some of the, the um, we have, have caused some, some problems within um, our state, our nation, uh, but we also offer solutions that nobody else can offer. Sure. And that's important. So I'm very excited because with the Hypergator at the University of Florida, the, the largest supercomputer at any state university, right. I believe, in the country, um, we are using artificial intelligence to quantify certain ecosystem services on working ag lands. And um, from that, we'll, we'll be able to move forward. And then now, now that we know how to quantify those services, that, that water uh, storage or water recharge biodiversity, then we have to work on how, how do we compensate these landowners for, for keeping land to produce right. those services. Um, and that's going to be a, a real challenge. But again, I think the University of Florida can rise to the occasion, and they've got economists and, and uh, people who know how to develop things like that. So I'm super excited about that particular program. Um, and I think that the more we can do to keep landowners doing what they're doing today, the better off the state will be. We need to keep this, these lands in production agriculture, and that's that's really important to me, and that's why I spend so much of my time advocating agriculture. Well, and I and other landowners and farmers and ranchers, as well as citizens of this state, appreciate somebody with you, to you taking time to do that. It is such a value not only to, to us as an industry, but to us as a society to make sure that some of these lands are are kept in agriculture so we do have a green space we do have a wildlife habitat that we do have water recharge that we have so many things that what we have that proffer the benefit to an economy ecology and as well as an environmental benefit to <clears throat> to us as a society as a whole and that's why it's important to have a an operation that is growing commercial wood to be able to generate the revenue to be able to take care of that asset and then be a good steward of it but also the tools that are available to, to keep some of this land in, um, in production, agriculture, silviculture, is, is some of the, the, the conservation easements that you've already alluded to. There's competition for this land. There is competition to put development on it. And I'm, I'm sure y'all get pressures and probably get phone calls from somebody that says, hey, we'd like to buy that land. Where, where do you see the future of these lands, agriculture, civiculture lands, especially timberlands in the state, with that kind of pressure, it, it, do you think that the conservation easements are the answer, or just part of the tools to be able to secure that? Where, 
where can we go? How I know a lot of people have concerns that all this is just going to get put into an impervious surface layer and yeah. be houses and development, but they also now we recognize there's a need to generate revenue. Farmers are and ranchers and timber growers they they can't do it for nothing. What other answers? What do you see? Where do you see the the future of the timber industry in the state of Florida? I'll start this. Lynetta probably is better educated on it than me, but for me as a younger getting older but younger generational landowner with um nieces and nephews a child of my own sure um you gotta somehow incentivize a landowner to maintain agriculture because growing a crop and getting paid for that crop is not paying the bills quite honestly Uh, whether that be a beef cow watermelon a peanut a tree an orange grove whatever you want to call it there's just so many things working against you weather development people clogging the roads up you can't get your crops from point a to point b like you used to be able to uh labor force uh there's a lot of things working against you and lynetta's point on the you know ecosystem services i think those kind of things have to be kind of tallied into the you know you look at conservation easements and you're getting paid to not develop it well you're not getting paid to clean the air or clean the water or to burn and keep invading right. i mean that's what i was doing today was keeping cooking grass end of our pine stands trying to get that out of there because it spreads like wildfire um and no, to me no that, is, that is that <laughs> that is uh, that is um to me that's the biggest concern because my age group has zero interest in putting an investment in the ground that's going to be 20 years. Mm-hmm. i just talked to a guy yesterday unfortunately he has issues with the hurricane came through but he's like i don't i don't i can't i can't do the economics on it i'm like you can't you cannot do the economics on it and make it make sense especially in florida where your real estate is worth you know so much more than it is where timber is such a popular commodity because the land is cheap so it's a lot easier to do that so um to me that is you know you got to figure out a different way to use the dirt in order to pay for itself and there's things out there but again it comes back to easements go for tortoise banks um mitigation banks wetland you know but this ecosystem thing to me is a really great idea because it it's there it exists and people are benefiting it all the way around you and um it should be something that people are compensated for quite frankly so uh, you know i guess it you know put it you'd already said that before and, and but i guess if we don't do this the attractiveness of the the very end is is the the land value and it's it goes to highest and best use Correct. in regard to value not necessarily in regard to a long-term value to society but economic value at the present so it is imperative that we find other alternative resources of income and revenue for landowners so that they can hold on to that land and not have the not yield to the temptation of of selling Take to a developer yeah and, and one other thing i'll add i mean the one thing not get on any soapboxes, but my personal opinion, the one thing that the United States still has is the ability to feed ourselves. And when we lose the ability to feed our country with our own land, we lose we lose everything. Absolutely. And, and that I mean, I don't know what's going on in out west and where the you know, but here it starts here and, and, and if we can't you know, if we have to ship everything we eat, our food quality is gonna go down. It already has gone down and a lot of that is because we're We've grown ourselves out of being able to live off the land that we were put here to take care of. So. This is the Rural Recharge podcast. This isn't the Urban Expansion right. podcast, that's for sure. And it's just it's so, I think a lot of these concepts may be foreign to people. And they, and I think even the, the reality that landowners have to generate a revenue in order to hold on to that land and be a good steward of that land takes money, takes revenue, and we've got to have a way to, to derive it. So it's really... It's going to take a lot of different, uh, different sources, different ideas, but certainly ecological services is something that is very real, but has not been implemented yet, but is kind of a uh, in its infancy stages and, and being uh, dealt with. And that's where the hypergator is so important in this this in this this effort from our land grant institution here in the state of Florida to work with it is is outstanding and uh, we'll see what those values are and if long term they're sus- they're sustainable and our systems are sustainable i know I, you know i travel the state and people they want to see our 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 state not go into completely into a uh, become a an urban uh, 
an urban sprawl, just crammed, dense, populated place. But to have some of the things that made Florida, Florida, and has made Florida, Florida, uh, especially with the heritage that you, especially you have, is very long term, Mrs. Griner, and what a precious thing it is to to hold on to that, which makes your story even more more precious. Is to leave corporate the 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 things of the attractiveness of all the jobs and then to come back to that farm and to make sure that it's maintained. And because of that, I mean, you've received quite a few accolades through time and, and on your sustainability efforts. And I mean, I, I don't know how you find time to do all that you do. And especially even today to meet with us, but you're all over the place, even up to the national level. <clears throat> I mean, I just have a small list. I mean, you're a 2012 cares recipient, 2013 <coughs> woman of the year in agriculture, 2018 Florida Farmer of the Year, 2022 Commissioner's Agricultural Environmental Leadership Award. That is, I mean, that's just scratching the surface, and you find time to do that. What, what does it, what does it mean to you? And I mean, you've already alluded to it, but I just don't want to reiterate and emphasize being a spokesman and an advocate advocate for agriculture. What is that? Why, why do you do it? Well, it's important to me, and um, all of those recognitions give me a platform and uh, you know I can use those opportunities and, um, and resources to help educate people and I think that's really what it comes down to. Uh, people just don't understand what we do, why we do it, and the importance of what we do. Um, I know Eric was talking about trying to make a living off the land. And I think the good news in all of this is that a lot of our timber is grown north of I-4. Right. And sure. we haven't seen the development pressure yet, yet that we've seen south of I-4. You know, it is coming. I'm not blind to that. But so I think we still have time and opportunity to think outside the box, as sure. you were saying. We've got conservation easements is, is one tool in the toolbox. Maybe payment for ecosystem services is another. But farmers, ranchers, and and timberland owners have always been a little hard-headed. You know, <laughs> no, it's like no, no, you, you no. keep doing yeah, the same yeah. thing until you absolutely can't do it anymore. But in, in they've also been innovative. And, you know, so some people have, have started hosting uh, weddings, parties, ven- creating venue opportunities on their lands, um, hunting opportunities. Sure. We get calls all the time for people looking for land to hunt on. Um so there are, are other re- revenue streams out there. Uh, Eric mentioned gopher tortoise banking. That's right. So we have those opportunities, but it takes time and energy and effort to develop those. So um, I'm super excited about the payment for ecosystem services. I think that's, that's really attractive. A conservation easement, when you sell that, that's for perpetuity, forever, for generations and generations. And a payment for ecosystem services, in my mind, would be for a time certain. It might mean that we would enhance a practice we're already doing, change a practice, employ a practice we've never employed before for a certain period of time to enhance the benefit of water storage or something, some service that we're providing. And that, to me, is going to give you a revenue stream that you can use right then. And so um, it, it's important that we look at all these opportunities because once you've sold those conservation easements, that's done. We've still got to have more revenue streams in, in the Absolutely. future, 30 years from now, say, because it, otherwise the other option is to grow a house, and that's the last crop I want to grow on our property. Sure. Well, I thank you so much for what you do do, and the, the recognitions are, are minimal to what you do and put in, your, in regard to volunteer and time and effort. Just thank you so much for what you do do. Eric, if you were to leave one last thing for the listeners today, what would it be? I would say yes. Um, <laughs> that's not loud. what I was going to say. Say it out loud. <laughs> say it. Say it. No, Come on, Eric. Uh, in all seriousness, um, I would say, you know, like Lena says, print your email, use paper, because without a good market for timber, people are not going to plant trees. So you got to have a market. If you don't have a market, the trees eventually will die and nobody will replant them. Um, you need a working force in order to conquer all the different things we've discussed. That's a good point. A very good point. Use paper and keep us in business and keep our forests viable and sustainable. You want sustainability? Use the wood. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Mrs. Kreiner, if you had one thing to leave with the listeners today, what would it be? Get out there and enjoy a forest. There you go. I think that's what got you probably. You just wanted to go to the woods, stay in the woods. Yeah, there wasn't much staying inside at my house when I was a kid. (laughs) That wasn't much of an option, so I guess so, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, Florida Farm Bureau's theme for 2023 is growing forward. In your day-to-day role, how are each of you growing Florida agriculture forward? I'll start with Mrs. Kreiner. I'd like to think that we're growing it forward because we have a plan in place. And I think that's important for all agriculturalists mm-hmm. to have a plan in place for succession and, and for sustainability. Sure. Uh, we have Eric on our forestry side. We have our son, Corey, on the, the yeah. cattle and farm side. And it's so important to um, recognize the, the oncoming generations and the future generations and cultivate their love for the land that we have for our for it ourselves, and um, I think the future's bright. Uh, I've just been engaged with a couple of young FFA leaders, and you know, if, if you surround yourself with those kind of people, you can't help but be Absolutely. motivated. Yeah. They uh, they have a, a great spirit there. So uh, I appreciate so much what all of our trade associations uh, do for us. Whether it's the Forestry Association, the Cattlemen's, or Florida Farm Bureau. Um, you speak up for us when we don't have the time and the opportunity to do so. And it's so important to keep agriculture in front of those policymakers. And, right. and um, the importance of that just can't be understated. So thank you for all that you do. Wow, those thoughtful words. Eric? Um, I would say, uh, Lynetta had a good point, planning. I would say educate. Um, and then I would say, you know, um, you got to educate the next generation and then you got to listen to the next generation because at the end of the day, they're the ones taking it over. So if they have off the wall ideas that maybe you thought were crazy, but Hey, they're the ones coming. And so, you know, it's important to try to navigate things in a direction to where they are excited about managing the land because it's not a big paying job and it's not an easy paying job. And it's important to, um, kind of follow their lead so that they're doing something they enjoy and it, it continues going forward. I mean, they could plan and then have it all laid out and then say, nope, it, 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 it just discourage you from I, doing it. Let me, just, <laughs> let me just, I have two sides of this thing. I have a family <laughs> that is moving out of, a, of the second generation into the third, and then I have a work family that is moving same direction, second to the third. And I, they've both navigated it well, but I can see – how that it and I've seen other families not navigate it well, and that is when usually that generational land ownership fails from one generation to the next is because the one coming up just is not you know that's a stupid you know it's just you gotta if you want them to take it over then this is how they want to do it sure. then you better help them get there. And that's not easy. No, it's not. I can say that it's it not. it wasn't easy for my father and mother to to give up control and to let Ken and me. Uh, come in and, and implement ideas that we had, and it's not been easy for Ken and me to listen to Corey and Eric um, about the ideas that they have, but we we still managed to have a good time, and uh, we're still at it, so well, <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's hope for our future. <laughs> well, I'm only a fifth generation, and I understand exactly it is, and the sixth generation is back on the farm, so I appreciate your input, Eric, because it is to listen to that next generation is critical. I was there. And I can tell stories, but I also am am there, and and it. also, but it you can't what we have with a, a generation coming forward, uh, the desire to be engaged in what we do is precious, and we need to help and assist to make sure that that's done. I just want to say thank you to you both. Thank you for taking time to be with us. I'm sure this audience has absolutely had a, a great opportunity to get to know you, but also to to be able to learn a lot about. Uh, Forestry Week, which is October 22nd to 28th. Thank you all again. Thank you very much.